So today um, we're going to introduce this concept of the Lean Startup. And um, actually one of the people that coined the word is named uh, Eric Reese. We're going to watch a short video from him uh, at a conference that he gave just to take another look at that. If we have enough time, which we usually don't given how quickly these things go, uh, we've done a video case study of a local company called Four Moms uh, and how they really nailed the customer discovery piece early on. Uh, uh, but I don't know that we will get to that. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite shows growing up, Different Strokes. So I looked at the audience and none of you have any idea who this person is or what he was, but his name is uh, 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 Gary Coleman. And he had a famous line, what you talking about, Willis Willis is his brother. Because when we talk about lean startups, a lot of people think that this is only software and it's not. It is for any type of product or service. Um, you you know, the, the folks at Four Moms that applied low cost electronics and robotics to baby products. Um, that's Rob Daly on the left and uh, Henry Thorne on the right. Henry Thorne is an uh, entrepreneur in residence here at the uh, Swartz Center. He works, uh, does, he's a world-class roboticist and mechanical engineer. So if any of you need help with mechanical engineering or robotics, Henry, Henry, Henry is your guy. We can connect you with him. Uh, this is ha Hannah Alexander and Matt Stanton. Uh, they won, they, they were undergraduate students here and uh, also got fifth year masters in the mechanical engineering department. They won the invention of the year award for soul power uh, and soul power was putting a sensor in your shoe to capture the kinetic energy of walking converted into electrical energy that could be stored in a battery. Uh, they use this process in their company and even Meredith Grelly, who makes my favorite product whiskey uh, uh, uses uh, these lean startup concepts in, in, in developing uh, her, her products as well. So this can be for anything. Uh, it, it's a high level process uh, and, and we'll try to um, uh, introduce it today. So I always like to start off with a, a riddle and uh, the world record for solving this riddle by a Carnegie Mellon uh, attendee of a Connects workshop is, is nine seconds. All right. So I'm going to see if we got any world class riddle solvers in the audience here today. And if you've seen it before, you're not eligible. But I'm, I'm doing the basketball count as the referee gets the ball up there. We're already at four, right? Old fart on the left, old car, old glory, right? Now you should get this. I mean, I just gave it away, right? Old fart, old car, old glory. Okay, we're not going to get the record. Where are all of those old things on that slide? Where are they? They're at the bottom. Under what? There's nothing new under the sun. All right? And, and so when we hear these terms and concepts uh, for lean startup, it's just a vocabulary applied to a set of concepts that I will prove to you today have uh, existed for a long time, and, and that's why they actually work. So one of I wanted to give you the, sort of the history of how the lean startup uh, terminology came to be. Uh, some of you will recognize this from your history classes uh, in, in high school or college. Uh, but the first thing uh, that, that this is related to is Kaizen, right? Kaizen. Who here knows what Kaizen is? Max. Max, I gave you a prompt right here. Can you read? Oh, wait, you're from Tepper. You can't read. Bye. You're from robotics. <laughs> rapid, continuous, rapid, continuous, incremental improvement, right? It's iteration, iteration, right? That, that's where. And who knows where the term Kaizen came from? Toyota. <clears throat> good, good try. Wrong answer. You said Toyota too? Boy, your history books are telling you lies. Anybody else? Anybody? Come on, I won't, I won't, uh, pardon me? Honda. Honda, there you go. Uh, Honda beats Toyota every time, right? No, uh, so, okay, so what happened is World War II, um, the United States was in conflict with Japan and unfortunately, um, you know, it, the war was ended by dropping atomic bombs and it decimated uh, the industry in Japan. It was sad, right? And then they firebombed Tokyo. And so it was interesting because the U.S. government had a thing in Europe called the Marshall Plan. Do you remember hearing about the Marshall Plan? It was about rebuilding infrastructure in Europe. They also had a similar plan to work with the Japanese government to rebuild industrial capability in, in Japan. And it was actually a group called the Civil Communications Section of the Economic and Scientific Section. And they actually developed 
a series of videos for this once in a lifetime white sheet of paper ability to break, build things from the ground up called Improvement in Four Steps or Kaizen Anyo Yondanke. So Kaizen is, literally means improvement. And so this concept of lean manufacturing was built into the rebuild of the Japanese industrial capability in the 50s, 60s, uh, and became very, very popular. Um, we actually started to call it agile manufacturing. You've probably heard that term as well. And so as it things uh, sort of uh, developed, uh, by the way, it was the, the person responsible for it was Edwards Deming, who has the Deming Award for high quality in manufacturing, just to know oh, some names that you've heard. But this was sort of the beginning of the Agile Clean Revolution. It became very, very popular in manufacturing all over the world. The Japanese led the way, uh, and it gave them incredible advantages through the, the 1970s. Um, and then the software world started to, to take notice of this agile approach in the 1990s. And there was a lot of work that was done to develop and change the process by which software was developed. The most popular method was the waterfall method and change into this agile method. In fact, there's a manifesto written by these two guys, other than in Schwaber. Uh, Ken Schwaber is actually the father of Scrum. And emphasize these four points in, in, in their manifesto, which was number one, we value inter individuals and interaction over process and tools. We gotta talk to our customer. We have to listen to our customer. We value working software over comprehensive documentation. So we're gonna constantly prototype and get the software into the hands of our customer. We believe in customer collaboration rather than writing contracts, right? We want to continually work and add value, provide value to our customers. That's the reason to be as an entrepreneur. And then we want to respond to change and learnings instead of following a rigid plan, right? So those were the concepts that were really behind the Agile Manifesto. And as it became more popular in software development, um, the startup world started to take notice of it. And this was uh, in over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, this is a cartoon. It's Will, you know, I, one of my entrepreneurship professors showed me this many, many years ago. He used to say, you know, your customers are the dogs. Are they going to eat the dog food that you're going to provide for them? And so there is a reason that we've heard about failure rates for, for startups. Who knows what the, the failure rate for startups is? Anybody? Take a stab. There's lots of data out there. You probably heard it. So what's, what's the failure rate? What percent? 40%. 40%? 90%? 99%? Yeah, it's probably closer between 96 and 99% of all startups fail. And it's even worse than that because a lot of those failures are things that just get started and aren't a lot of resources put against them. People give up. So, so you know, that's anything in zero to five years. So, so the numbers are stark because some of those companies never really were going to be companies because people weren't committed to them. But um, there was a statistic that came out just a few years from the National Venture Capital Association um, that said 70% uh, of all companies fail to return capital uh, to, to venture capitalists. So those that have raised at least a Series A or Series B fail to return capital, right? So, so it's hard work. Right. And, you know, you're doing God's work here, those of you that want to be entrepreneurs. And hopefully by following some of the frameworks and principles, we can dramatically reduce the failure rates. But there is one reason above all that startups do fail. And, do, and does anybody in here know what that is? One driving reason over and over again. It, it, that's a way to describe it, but there's actually some more detail to that. Anybody else? not talking to your customers enough early and often, right? So we come up with a solution and we try to shove it down our customer's throat without actually having understood who our customer is, right? So, so the startup world started to take notice of this and, and about 10 years ago, the, the, the term, the lean startup following the agile principles that we've just talked about came into vogue and it gave us another term. I'm sure everybody's heard this term before up there in red. What, what does that stand for? No. Why does everybody get this wrong? It means most valuable player. It always has and it always will. You can't steal somebody else's word, right? So um, one of our professors here at Carnegie Mellon has come up with another term for this that we use. And so I don't want to hear anybody say MVP anymore. Promise me. No MVPs, right? You have 
MAPs, minimally awesome products, right? And uh, Sean Amirati is the person that coined this term. He's going to come in, I think, next week and do sort of a lean um, uh, manufacturing startup kind of uh, talk. And he'll talk about, you know, what it means to do a minimally awesome product versus a minimally viable product. We don't want it to be just viable. We want to be awesome, right? But the, the, the point is true. You want to quickly get product in front of your customers from their interaction and continue to iterate in the Kaizen fashion that we're talking about, all right? So what that means is in our world, and if you've been to the uh, uh, two or connects or earlier this week on uh, Trimmer Discovery and is your idea a good idea or business model canvas, these, these things were talked about. But customer discovery is just as important as product development. And that's what is the minimum viable product means in lean startups. And, and these are actually the guys, Steve Blank, who is the father of the NSFI core program, Eric Reese, who we're going to see a video uh, from. And then Tom Eisenman's a professor at, at, at Harvard that did a lot of early research and work and publishing on this concept. So you're hearing these things. What it really means is that in parallel, we talk to our customers as we develop our solution to their problems. Because if we're not solving a customer's problem, we're doing the wrong thing. They don't care about our solution, they care about their problem. So that's, of those of you that are in NSFI core, that's what you're gonna spend the next couple of months doing, is that customer discovery to understand what that problem really is, and then your solutions that you're sort of hypothesizing, are they good solutions? So. So the, you're going to hear from Eric Reese is that when we're startups, we have an unknown problem because we haven't validated the problem yet and an unknown solution. And that's why Kaizen rapid continuous incremental improvement sort of comes into play. And so agile is this continual iteration on improving. So customer development meets the product development. And that is what the lean startup is. But my hypothesis here is that this is nothing new under the sun, right? Because what we just talked about, right, coming up with a hypothesis, testing it with our customers, analyzing what we learned from that, and then deciding if we're going to run the experiment again the same way or adapt, is something that everybody here has used since they were at least in middle school. So the lean startup is not what that you all learned in middle school? Bye. Exactly. It's the scientific method applied to business. That's why it works, right? And the scientific method is actually really simple. It's not a complex thing, right? It's that we come up with a hypothesis of what the problem that we think we're solving. We go and talk to customers to validate that hypothesis. We learn from what they tell us. And we either pivot away from what we thought was the problem to a, to a new definition or hypothesis of the problem, or we continue on if we're hearing again and again from the people that we talk to, right? So while you're here, so the, the, your customer discovery is often thought of as just talking to customers. It's not. It's, a, it's really design thinking at its core. And there are many, many different techniques for engaging with customers that are more than just interviewing them. Interviewing them is a great way to start. You know, we, we talk about here at, at, um, at Carnegie Mellon of not just going to your average customer first, but try to find a thought leader or an expert in the domain that you're serving and take the questions that you would ask to a normal customer there and validate with that thought leader, that domain expert, that these are the right questions to be asking in that domain right now, right? Then you can go and start to do in-depth interviews, but you can also do things like observing a customer, just shadowing them right? Not talking to them, just observing. Their actions speak louder than their words, right? You can get groups of customers together and things called focus groups. So they're great to, to, to really generate a, a lot of quick consensus on problems and solutions. Um, and there's all kinds of other techniques that you can use um, that we will teach you in the NSF i -Corps program, or if you continue to come to these Connect seminars, or if you take classes, they're, I, I can't cover even the names of all of them today, but if you're going to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to commit to this rigorous process of customer discovery. And the best way to learn about it is study the design thinking principles that are readily available out there on the, on the web today. And this is not new because I went to Carnegie Mellon 30 years ago. I hate to say it, I always do. And I learned this process with just different words and different uh, uh, 
you know, sort of uh, titles to them by this guy here, Frank Demler. Many of you have seen Frank before. Doesn't he look exactly like Yoda? How many of you had Frank in class? A few, right? He's awesome. Uh, he's really good at what he does. Uh, he teaches entrepreneurial finance uh, at, at CMU right now. But uh, we have a joke, and some of you that have been uh, through the Schwartz Fellowship induction ceremony, uh, is that you know, you're not an entrepreneur in Pittsburgh unless you've been hit upside the head by a two-by Frank. Uh, Frank Demmler is the most straightforward, honest guy, but he can come across as a son of a bitch. So if you are going to go meet him, you know, know that his advice will be good and honest and that he doesn't mean it personally. So don't take it personally, but it's good to get people um, um, like that. What I'd like to do right now is, is actually show a quick video of Eric Reese, who wrote the book, The Lean Startup. Have anybody here read The Lean Startup? Okay, a few. Um, Reread it because there's some really great stories in there of how companies like Dropbox did customer discovery. Uh, and, and I could name other examples that are there too, but uh, it'll, it'll help you think about it, uh, um, of some of these other techniques for engaging customers. Let me quickly put the video on. corporate innovation space right now um, because lots and lots of people have, have crowded into the to the startup innovation space. But um, what I'd like to do now is, is actually um, talk about the, the different failure modes that you're going to uh, encounter as an entrepreneur. So um, have any of you read Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One? A few? Okay. So what zero means is you're at the idea phase and one means product market fit, right? You've got a minimally awesome product that you've proven that you're solving a real problem and it's easy to get your customer to buy the next incremental version of your product. So um, most of the failure in startups happens in between zero to one. And that's where most of you are right now and in, in, in embarking on the customer discovery problem. Problem. And you're going to encounter these failure modes, so I want to uh, alert you to them. The first one is the false positive, right? And this is most closely associated with talking to a few customers, right, and thinking that you're getting a signal from them that you are solving a real problem, but it's not enough customers to actually validate the problem, right? And one of the really easy things to do is to say, I'm going to do discovery at Carnegie Mellon. But Carnegie Mellon is just, you know, its own little micro ecosystem. And if you don't get out of the Carnegie Mellon micro ecosystem, you're not going to talk to a variety of customers who are different in different ways to get to that. So, so this is the most common problem, false positives. You don't talk to customers and you think you know the answer, but you actually don't. The second one's a little bit harder. It's the signal to noise problem, is that you talk to lots and lots of customers and you're being confused by the answers. It seems that the answers are in opposition to each other. And this is usually happens because you enter some sort of bias into the questions and answers that you're getting to customers, right? And, and one of the most common biases is that sort of friendship bias, right? You go to your friends and you ask them for feedback and what do you think they're gonna tell you? Not what they really think, what they think you wanna hear because you're the, you're the friend and they want you to be successful. So they lie to you, right? And that's just one example of the signal to noise problem. So you have to work very, very hard to try to take any bias out of any questions or observation or action that you have with customers. And, and the third one is, is really solvable too. And it's that even if you do understand the customer's problem and you've and that they're willing to pay to solve it, you can still fail because your product sucks, right? And what do I mean by that? I, you know, it could, suck, but it could be a good product, but it's not better than the other products that exist already, right? So this gets us to the next issue, is how do I ensure that I get customers to switch and to use my product or service. And we use this term here at Carnegie Mellon called the goodness factor. Um, the guy that's on that pillar over there, Don Jones, uh, is a famous robot entrepreneur. He endowed the Don Jones Center for Entrepreneurial Studies here at Carnegie Mellon. He was my mentor and my co-founder of my first company. And uh, he had this concept published uh, and it was the goodness factor. And the goodness factor is this. If you enter a market that has an existing solution, and the product is at the relatively the same price, then you have to be three times better to get people to change. Or if you're offering the same benefit, you have to be three times cheaper. 
Okay, three times better or three times cheaper. Does anybody know why that's true? Evan? It's switching friction, but there's a, there's a better way to say it. People are fundamentally lazy, right? Lazy in a good way in that they form habit. The great habit force is there, and they don't want to change. Think if you had to make decisions about everything you did all day long, your brain would fry, right? So we form habits and it becomes our muscle memory, right? We just do the same things over and over because it makes our life easier. So if we're going to switch, right? If we're going to switch, then something has to compel us to switch. And it's usually a compellingly better experience or a compellingly cheaper experience. Right? And so my favorite one, and again, I look around the crowd and say, maybe some of you won't, weren't even born when this happened. But in 1990, they declared the search wars over, right? There was the best search engine in the world at the time. Anybody know what that was in 1998? Yeah. <laughs> it's Lycos, man. Lycos was invented right here at Carnegie Mellon. It was the first web crawler. There was Alta Vista. There was Yahoo. I like Yahoo. Um, and there was a site at home, right? And everybody had their favorite one, and they were going to use that. But something did happen in 1998. I heard somebody mention it. What happened in 1998? Google happened, right? And I remember the first time that I used Google. I mean, I literally had the wow, aha moment. This is so much better than Lycos that I was using, right? So, so Google had a goodness factor that was measured in the hundreds, right? It was so much better. And, you know, I, I, I was an entrepreneur at the time. And, and before being able to use Google to research a problem, doing the secondary market research that would lead into customer discovery might take me weeks or months of going to a library and digging up that information. I had to have some specialized knowledge to do that. And then once Google indexed the world for us, it was an afternoon. I could find anything that I needed to find in an afternoon. It was it just compressed time dramatically, right? Well, forward to today, and I mentioned two books today, The Lean Startup and uh, uh, Zero to One. They were written by Peter Thiel on the left and Ben Horowitz from Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, Ben's telling you that he thinks you're number one. Uh, Ben's a, if you haven't read either of these books, along with The Lean Startup, I would definitely read these two books. They're, they're great books. And they postulate in there that the goodness factor is no longer just three times better or three times cheaper. It's 10 times better or 10 times cheaper. And the reason is there's been a proliferation of new products and services that have been enabled by lower cost uh, electronics, by open source software, right? Those sorts of things, by cloud computing, right? There's just been many, many more choices. So you have to be way more compelling than you used to have to be to get people to switch. And I'm going to use Google as an example today. There is published research that shows Bing is provably better than Google. Bing is provably better than Google. How many of you use Bing? One, you're a Microsoft employee, right? Oh, usually that's the answer. Okay, it came as the de default search engine on the machine that you bought, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? Nobody here chose to use Bing, even though it's better than Google, provably. Why is that? Namita, it's just a teeny bit better. It's not compellingly better or compellingly cheaper, right? It's the same, essentially. And nobody's going to change their habit because of something that's only teeny bit better. We have to be compellingly better or compellingly cheaper. So as you go out and you start to do your customer discovery and then you validate the problem, you start to introduce your solution to your customers, you're looking for, is this compellingly better than what they're doing now to solve it? Because if it's a real problem, they're trying to do something to solve it. They're looking for competitive products, they're daisy chaining a solution together of their own, right? They're trying to do, build in-house software to solve it. So they're doing something, and that's what you're looking for when you're validating the problem. The question is, is what you're going to deliver compellingly better or compellingly cheaper? And a lot of entrepreneurs fall in love with their own product and are not objective about that. So that's really, really important to be objective about the goodness factor. So how do we measure goodness factor? The goodness factor is in quantitative benefits. And I'm going to make the argument for, for you guys right now that there are only three benefits in the world that matter. There are no other benefits that matter, just three. 
and you probably all know what they are. I'll go quickly because we save some time here. First is that time. Time is a measurable entity, and we can assign a value to it, right? So saving time is a benefit. Saving or making people money is a benefit, right? It's a way to measure how much better or how much cheaper something is, right? And then the third one's a little bit more complex. I call it the Zuckerberg benefit, right? You all saw the movie Social Network, right? Mark Zuckerberg's a nerdy college sophomore at Harvard, and girls hate him. He can't get a date. So he creates Facebook so he can get hooked up. Right? That was the motivation. Right? I see some guys chuckling. Yeah, I have that problem too, right? This is this is Carnegie Mellon. We're pretty nerdy here. But it is. So, you know, obviously that is why Tinder and Match and eHarmony are so popular. People want to find romantic love. But in the business context, it can also be relationships like finding a customer or finding a supplier or finding a new employee or finding an investor. Those are relationships that are important to startups, right? So I argue that they're, these are the only three benefits that exist in the world. And I always get an argument. Who wants to argue with me? Anybody? I'll argue with myself. Fame and recognition is a benefit. Like if I make somebody famous, they're happy, right? Well, why do they care about fame and recognition? To either get more money or to get more girls or boys, right? So it just breaks down to these other ones. Well, what about altruism and doing good? Isn't that matter? Well, most of the people that I think are doing altruistic things are doing the same thing. They want to find somebody to love them or they want to make money, right? No, I'm joking. Okay, don't take me seriously. There are many more complex benefits in the world, right? Like enjoyment is a benefit, right? I had fun. But the definitions of each of those benefits are very complex and they mean different things to different people. These mean exactly the same thing to everybody, right? Time is time for everybody. Money is money for everybody. And getting a new relationship, whether it's a customer or an investor or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, those are measurable things, right? So when you're a nobody that nobody sent as a new company and you're talking to customers or potential customers you never met before, you can't rely on them understanding a more complex benefit. You have to break it down to something that they understand. And if you watch television commercials, the best television commercials will break things down into one of these benefits. Four out of five dentists recommend whatever, right? Those kinds of things. So those are the things to look for and a way to communicate what you're doing to your potential customers. Communicate it in terms that we all understand. Saving time, saving or making money, or creating new valuable relationships. And if you don't do it, you're going to run into trouble because you're going to think you're understanding each other because you're using the same words, but they mean different things. Very important. You um, saw on Tuesday, if you were here, Bill uh, uh, Kegler talked about the business model canvas. This is another great tool, right? And you should use this religiously. You should post it in the conference room of where you all work together so that there's a truth copy of everybody on your team understanding and believing the same things. I like to use red, yellow, green post notes where I put them in there because red means it's a hypothesis that we haven't yet validated. Yellow means we're getting closer to validation. Green means it's a fact. We validated this amongst our team and it keeps your team together. I'll never forget, um, this was my fourth startup selling uh, using artificial intelligence to sell stock picking recommendation software to Wall Street. And we had a, a, a bunch of employees up in New York City and we had gotten about 10 to 20 customers really quickly. And then we kind of hit a wall and I called together our management team and we sat in an apartment that we had up in, in New York and we went around the room and had everybody do a 30 second elevator pitch of who our company was. And in that, and in that pitch, you say who your customer is, what value you're delivering to them is a quantitative goodness factor, right? What their choices of other products are to solve that problem. And then you reiterate the goodness factor again, right? We went around the room and you would have thought there was five members of the management team. There were five different companies. Over time, we had all drifted away from the own feedback that we were getting from customers that we were selling to or customers that we had that we were serving. And everybody on the team had a different vision of what it was we were today and what it was we were going to be tomorrow. Because 
it's easy to get off track. So the business model canvas to me is a great tool to keep everybody on the team on the same page as we validate our problem, validate our value proposition, which is the goodness factor, right? Those are the two building blocks that matter. You're serving and the you're delivering to them. All the rest is just filling in and supporting those two key things. So in your customer discovery, you want to make sure that you're serving the right segment of your co potential customers. You can't serve all your customers. You have to segment down to a starting point, a beachhead, and then you have to ensure that you're delivering compelling value. Three to 10 times better, three to 10 times cheaper, or you're gonna fail. And if you can take the bias out of the questions that you ask and the, the, the discovery that you do and that you ensure that you have a goodness factor in your product, your success rate goes through the roof. You will be successful. Okay, so that's all I have today in terms of what the Lean Startup is and some things to, to focus on. 